sound ready. I'm just rolling? Okay. Uh, so everyone, our first speaker today is uh, Akram Tagavi Burris, who is an instructor at the University of Tulsa in their computer simulation and gaming degree program. Some of you are probably going, what? There's a degree program at TU? Yes, there is. Pretty popular, as I understand. And uh, she's going to be talking about player-centric design, uh, which is going to dovetail really nicely because later on we're going to have some Unity demonstrations, Unreal demonstrations, and uh, we're going to have a talk about uh, some Kickstarter funding. So it uh, should be a fun day. And everyone, please give a hand to Ms. Akram Tagavi Burris. <laughs> Just, oh, I got to talk into the mic, okay. So anybody who's just getting started in game design, maybe you haven't picked up a game engine, maybe you're still learning programming and just want to bring your ideas to fruition. So this is where you'd want to start. And player-centric design all is all about becoming an advocate for the player. So when we talk about game design in general, first you've got to think about what is a game? How are play different from a game? Anybody? How is just playing around different from playing a game? What's a big thing that's different about it? Anybody? Oh, what was it? Somebody said rules? <laughs> <laughs> rules are one of the big elements, is that you have a boundary within a game. Play is just infinite. It's whatever you want. But when we talk about this, we look at play is to take part in an enjoyable activity. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our viewers at home can only see your laptop. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a big laptop. All right, so play is to take part in an enjoyable activity for the sake of amusement. And interesting thing about play is that historians have found that this, that the activity of playing and also music has been around since early civilization, since early mankind we have had a need to have this activity of play. Now, when we talk about games, one of the things that we talk about is that you're in this fictional world, you, that you are bound by the rules of the game. And this fictional wor world requires us to pretend. And this means that we create this reality in our mind. <coughs> In order to make this fictional world more believable, it's best to use storytelling and graphics. And that's one of those big dramatic elements of games that engages the players. So as I said earlier, with game design, if you're thinking about being a game designer, you want to be an advocate for the player. And what this means is that everything that you do, you've got to think about, will the player enjoy this? How is the player going to react? And when we think about where do ideas come from, maybe you're thinking about making a game, but you're not really sure, like, what kind of game do I make? Well, when it comes to inspiration, uh, game developers just look at the entire world, look at everything in terms of challenges, structures, and play. I mean, think about games like Cooking Mama. I mean, that's just a cooking game. I mean, you know, how, how entertaining is that? But they look at it as like, well, here's the challenge. Can you cut these vegetables in a certain amount of time? There's a structure to it, so there's a set amount of rules of, of what you can and can't do in the game. And then it's fun and entertaining. So these kind of things can apply to anything in your daily life. So the player-centric design approach involves the player throughout the design process. And we're going to look at the different stages of this process. And each stage, you have to go back and think about your player. So when we look at player-centric design, it's made up of seven different stages. The first stage, which is where you're probably at now, is just brainstorming. Like, how do I come up with an idea for this game? But the second stage, which is often not talked about, and which I'm going to highlight here, is a physical prototype. So you've come up with an idea. Again, you may be just starting out. You may not have those skills to program or build something in an engine. But you want to see if this game is even feasible. So you can create a physical prototype. This can be a board game, a card game, anything just to see if the game dynamics work. And I'll talk more about this here momentarily. But this is a great way to just test out your game idea. 
Once this works, you can flush out the ideas into a game treatment, fully figure out how it's going to work, the story, everything of that nature, and then you get into that software prototyping phase. The design document specifies all the details of the game itself. It's a living document that continues to be revised as the game goes into development. You go into full production mode after that. And then finally, quality assurance where you test the games and make sure that it's all ready to go. When you look at the player-centric design stages, you can apply that to the generic game design stages. And here you can see how it's all kind of broken out from your concept phase to your pre-production, production, and Q&A and maintenance. And it is a inverted triangle because a lot of your heavy lifting happens at the very beginning. Once you've gotten that game kind of narrowed down and you're into production most, the workload kind of streamlines into a more focused output. So the first thing, like I said, all good games start with a brainstorming activity. So you just got to start thinking about ideas and just start jotting them down. You know, it's a good idea for any creative individual to carry a notebook with them and just start writing things uh, when an idea pops into your head, because one idea may trigger a new idea later on. And I do suggest for those of you in the digital era, if you don't have a notebook handy, there's lots of uh, note apps out there, like uh, Google uh, Keep is one of them, Evernote. It's just a good resource, and what's nice about the digital notebooks is that no matter where you are, if you have internet access, you have your notebook handy. So these are just ways to start generating ideas. Once you have an idea, you've got to ask yourself some major questions. It may be the most awesome idea ever, but first off, is it technically feasible? You know, do, is, does the technology exist for us to build such a game? Secondly, is there a market for it? The, a lot of the early games uh, back in the early 80s, the days of the arcades failed because they were not a market for it. Uh, a lot of early arcade games were designed by computer engineers who had like physics backgrounds and the games were just too technical for the average arcade player. So a lot of those games ended up failing. So you have to think, who is your market and would your market be the ones playing this game? Another important aspect, especially in our time of where we need funding to build games, is it profitable? You know, is somebody going to buy this game? And again, with money in the background, you know, do you have the budget to produce this? Maybe it's a great game, you've got a market for it, but you yourself don't have the budget. There's ways around this, obviously. You could do things like Kickstarters, you could team up with other entities. But you've got to think, do, is there a budget that would be able to develop this game? But most importantly, are you in love with it? If you have any doubts about the game, as you start to build it, it's going to show. It's going to show that this game was not well designed, that the developers were not into it. So you really got to be passionate about the games that you choose to work on. And that enthusiasm that you have for the game will show in the development as you work on it. Once you have this basic concept, one of the best things to do is to create a creative center. And this is like a short sentence or two that helps people identify what your game is all about. So it's made of two parts, a razor and a slogan. It's referred to as the X statement in a lot of books on game development. And what the razor is, is it's basically an example of what the features are in the game. And then the slogan is a tagline. So for example, uh, the game Medal of Honor had the razor, razor of GoldenEye set in World War II on PlayStation. So it was a quick reference of what this game is like, where it's set it, and for what platform. The slogan was prepare for your finest hour. Something catchy, something that you could take away with you. 
So start thinking of your razor and your slogan once you have this concept so that you could quickly pitch this idea to individuals in two sentences. So they have a reference of what the game is like, what type of platform, and a quick tagline that they can remember. So as you get into the development phases, Again, you don't want to just jump in and start coding out a bunch of stuff. You want to think about the structure. And one of the things we emphasize with our students is this terms of gameplay and game mechanics. And with gaming, with all games, require good gameplay, game mechanics, feedback, risk and reward, and balance. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of these. But to talk about gameplay and game mechanics, we first need to talk about the elements that, that are required to make a game. And these elements are broken up into two parts. There are formal elements. So the first thing you have to have, well, you have to have players in order to have a game at all. You have to have an objective, a goal. This goes back to the difference between play and, ga and playing a game. So you have to have some sort of objective and goal. There should be procedures to how, you, uh, how the game functions. There should be rules that limit the boundaries of the game. There's oftentimes resources within the game. This could be anything from an economic system in the game to health, lives, score. Anything that has um, a utility in the game and a scarcity in the game is considered a resource then you have to have some sort of conflict that prevents you from meeting your objective, something that you have to overcome. The boundaries in the game are defined by the rules, but there should be some boundaries. Otherwise, it's a free-for-all, and you're just kind of playing at that point versus playing a game. And then with all games, there has to be an outcome. There has to be some resolution. Did you win? Did you lose? Do you go to the next level? What is the outcome? Now, all of these formal elements are required to actually make a functional game. But to make a game engaging to the player, it requires the inclusion of dramatic elements. The most important dramatic element is challenge. Is there challenge to the player? The next one we see is play. Is there an invitation to play? You know, what is driving the player besides achieving the objective to actually play this game. Most often than not, the invitation to play comes from the premise or the story. Now, not all games have a full drawn out story. For example, Space Invaders. There's simply a premise that Earth is being invaded by aliens and you've got to shoot them down. But some games thrive on having an immersive story that players get involved in. Along with that, sometimes there's even characters. Um, the Valkyrie Chronicles, for instance, the characters that you chose to be on your team could make a difference because each character had a backstory, each character had strengths and weaknesses, and depending on where you were going to go battle, the characters would make a difference in your little platoon. Another element of dramaticness uh, is style. This could be anything from the look, the feel, the sounds, the music. Uh, Okami is one that had that whole watercolor, water painting effect to it. So the style of the game could engage the players. Now that we've talked about the formal elements and the dramatic elements, this is where we go back to gameplay and game mechanics. So gameplay are those dramatic elements, primarily the three C's as we call them, challenges, choices, and consequences. These three items have to be well balanced within your game. You don't want your challenges to be trivial. You want them to have good flow, meaning that as the player progresses, they steadily get diffi more difficult, but they don't get too difficult that the player gives up. You don't want them to be too easy that the player gets bored. Then you have your choices, which need to be meaningful choices so that the player feels like their actions actually make a difference in the game. And then obviously you want some consequences. This creates um, some 
aspect of, you know, did I make the right choice? What's going to happen? And it also gives the outcome a more dynamic feeling because there are consequences related to any of the choices that the players make. So this is gameplay. Game mechanics are those procedures and rules of the formal elements. Those formal elements that are designed to help create good gameplay. So all of these systems work together. So, you know, does the rules and procedures provide the player enough options to, to gather those choices, to overcome those challenges? So it's a full mix between the two. So gameplay, game mechanics, number one things to think about from a player's perspective perspective as you start designing your games. Moving along, feedback is one of the most important things in your game. How many of you start a game by opening the little instruction book reading every single page? Right? No! We all play the game. How do you learn to play the game? Feedback, yeah, feedback. Feedback within the game. In the game you do something and something in the game tells you whether or not you're doing something right. And these feedback loops are basically player actions and they go back to encouraging the player to learn. And this is one of the things that games excel at. Games teach players to learn. In most cases, they learn how to play the game, but it's that constant feedback that creates that loop. And here you can see sort of a, a player feedback loop but again, you're going to give them feedback, whether it be positive or negative. It could be a variety of things. It could be text on screen. It could be a sound effect. It could be, you know, like a little yellow glow that shows, oh, something's over here. Come get me. It could be a score. It could be, you know, you regenerated. Obviously, that enemy killed you, so now you've got to battle it out again. So feedback to your player on what they're supposed to be doing is very important. The next element is risk and reward. So risk is the chance of losing something in order to gain something of greater value. Did it not? There we go. All right, so risk raises the level of tension, and then of course you have reward. Reward is the positive feedback and recognition that the player has overcome something. And rewards are incentives for the players to take the risk. And this is really good when we talk about balance coming up, is because you don't want your risk to be greater than your reward. So if you have them do some sort of challenge that's very difficult and then they only get 50 points for it, they're going to be like, well, what was the point of that? You need to balance things out. You also need to balance it out if you actually want them to take on those challenges. You want to make it an incentive for them. So a good balance of risk and reward. And that goes on into balance. Balance refers to the perception that the game is consistent, fair, and fun. And to establish this, your gameplay needs to provide consistently increase of challenge. You don't want something to suddenly seem too difficult or too di easy um, at any point in time. Also, fairness. By providing feedback, rewards in, instead of negative feedback as punishment. So you always want to try to give more positive feedback versus negative feedback. And again, you want to give the sense that the rules are fair and give the player the opportunity to win. And most importantly, it should be fun. Nothing should be so difficult, unless it's a jumping game, which I don't enjoy, um, that, that you can't overcome those challenges. You want the player to play the game. You want them to get to the end. You want them to play the game all over again. So there needs to be a sense of fun. If they ever hit a wall where they can't get over a challenge, the game may be unbalanced for the player. Another thing to keep in mind when we are talking about games versus play is that games require both interaction and challenge. And sometimes they're referred to as interactive challenges. And this is something that is very important for video games in general because there's that sense of interaction. There's some AI in the background that's creating interaction between the player and the challenges that they overcome. 
So as I mentioned earlier, you're at the beginning phases of your brainstorming, of your game design. Now it's time to start prototyping out those ideas. And again, with prototyping, you're really just looking at the game mechanics and the game play. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about playable uh, games. And these are just paper games. And it doesn't have to be your full-fledged out games. Uh, we have a course uh, where students design, this is actually one from this semester, their game. It's going to eventually be a digital game, but they have to design it in paper first. And I've had everything from first-person shooters to adventure games. Um, this was an interesting job simulation game where you had to get a job and then you had to do so many things in the job to get to the next part, to get supplies so you could get a new job. And the idea with a paper game is that you're just testing those choices, challenges, consequences, and those rules and procedures, the gameplay and game mechanics. You know, how, how does it work? You know, do the rules make sense? Challenges, choices, and consequences. These are all really easy to test. You know, you have to get a job, you have a limited budget, you have limited supplies, what job can you get with those supplies? And then randomization that was typically would be used within a digital game can be done with cards, dice, um, any number of tools to create some randomization. Now keep in mind that photo uh, physical prototypes simply work on the working of the gameplay, which is what we're looking at here. But when you're talking about things like first person shooters and stuff, in a lot of cases, when you do this physical prototype, you're really looking at balance. You're looking at, you know, how, how large of a space do you need? How many pickups do you need in order for the player to overcome the amount of zombies? How many limitations of zombies? Very quickly in a playable game field, you can roll the dice and say six zombies came in, but you only have one to pick up. You've got six squares in front of you to get to. You only ha can roll two, you know. How is that balanced? You're just looking at that balance and control and what controls you have. The actual fluidity of running around, the level of the space, the speed of things, that can only be tested in the software prototype but the paper prototype can help you get in a sense whether your game is fun to play. And I'm gonna switch gears real quick here to, uh, oops, let me do, let me minimize this, and uh, just give you a glimpse of some of the games that our students put together. These are all going to be digital prototypes by the end of the semester, but early on they had to, oh, it didn't switch over. <laughs> Let me, there we go, all right. So early on, they had to do a paper game. And it could be a variety of things. This one was a, a venture game where you had to collect jewels and uh, you can only access the blue areas once you had so many jewels. Um, oops, there was that uh, job game there. So in this case, they had different sheets for different levels. There weren't a lot of pieces to the game. But really, you started at a job. You each all had an equipment level of what equipment you got. Then you got a scenario card where you picked up a job. Then you got another card whether you accomplished that job. And you had different options as to whether you accepted the job or whether you took another job. And then depending on how much money you made from each job, you could then uh, move to the shop where you could in upgrade your equipment and so forth and so forth. So it was more of an adventure game, but the paper game was very simplified with just a number of cards and their teeny tiny little monies that they cut out for everybody. Um, again, all of them had to have rules. This was the most important part of this activity, is they had to set the rules and they couldn't tell the other players what the rules were, meaning that each team got to play everybody else's game solely with the written rules that were provided to identify whether the designers really thought this out, really thought about everything that would need to be in the game to make it playable. And that was one of the biggest struggles with any time we do this activity, that they don't list out all the things. 
And this is important when you get into software prototype for your conditionals. You know, how does this object work? What are its points values? How, what are the variables that you need? If you have this all written out ahead of time, it makes the software prototype a little bit easier. Again, you can kind of get a sense of how they work through some of these scenarios here. And some of them were very board like Some of them here, it was very much with chips, that you had to collect chips. Do, 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 do. Let me scroll through some of these photos here. Um, one in particular was really well done, um, which was kind of an adventure game that there was one with ducks. They go all out. It's an arts and craft project for them. This one, you had to get your duck to safety through the water, your duckling to safety through the water, and you had different ones. This one here, Cyber Gotcha. Uh, this one was a fun game. And it was completely done in paper, but you can totally get the concept of what it would be like. So it was sort of this action-adventure game where the uh, mobster has killed your father, um, and you have to go seek revenge. And so you start off in New York, and you all draw a weapon card. Your weapon card has so much power, and then you draw a, in a henchman card because they're out to get you. And you have to battle out so many henchmen by the time you make it to the end of the level in order to get to the next city. And it was a lot of fun because each weapon, they really thought about balance here, is that some people, for example, had like this massive weapon, but they, depending on the role and what enemy they got, it was like, it was like they were a stormtrooper. They hit nothing. And then somebody would get like a baseball bat and manage to make their way through the entire level just by chance, just by the challenges, just by the henchmen that they ended up with. So there was a lot of mystery. Like just because you had this great weapon didn't mean that you were going to make it through the level, which gave that outcome uh, a dynamicy that made it a lot more exciting. And then as you built up more skills through the level, you could actually upgrade your weapon from there. So then you had an option, and again, you could choose, you know, what weapon do you want? So now you're in control, but you don't really know what the consequences are behind that. So it worked really, really well, and it was a lot of fun to play this game. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, switch back here. So once you have that physical prototype, you're going to go in, or as you're developing the prototype, you're going to look at the foundations. You know, what do you need to have in your game in order for it to be playable or to get the idea of what you want across? Then structure has to do with all the important things that are a must in your game. The formal details are those rules. How do you make it playable? And as you add those rules, start playing with the ideas, is this rule really a necessity? Can you take it out and the game still function? Or does it have to be included? And then refinement, you know, just able to tweak the game to make it easier to play. And that's when you move into a play test. And the play test, the most important thing about a play test is the get the ideal player of the person you want to play the game. A lot of times when we do these first prototypes, we get our friends to play them. And that's great and all, but your friends may not be the person that you're going to be selling the game to. They may be out of the age group. They may be, you know, like we were talking about the early arcade games. They were all physicists and engineers, and they thought these trajectory games were amazing, but they just weren't practical for the average player. So again, you want to get actual play testers, especially if you're doing something for a different age group. You need to see what those p individuals like about the game, even when you're just doing your physical prototype. Once all that's done, then you move into your digital prototype. And the digital prototype should focus first and foremost on functionality. Does it work? Can you play the game? Secondly, balance, you know, is a good sense of balance and good flow. Can you move through the levels? Can you get through everything, those challenges and everything? 
And then once all those kinks are m m worked out, you move on to the development phase where you can start adding those dramatic elements, adding those cool graphics and sound effects and things like that. So from there, we're talking about making it a reality. So I've got a couple of slides here that will give you some ideas about building connections and skills for making games. As we said earlier, I teach computer simulation and gaming at the University of Tulsa, and we have just launched two new tracks in our degree program. So we have on this uh, first slide here the development track, which has a built-in computer science and math minor in the program. So it's very similar to our computer science degree. The main difference is, is that it has about four, five classes that are related to game design, uh, including things like game level design, uh, game uh, programming, as well as game engine design. So students actually develop their own game engine in one of the courses. Uh, the design track, which is what I actually oversee, has a built-in computer science minor and a built-in art minor. So in this track, we focus on the same concepts of level design and basic game design, but we also focus on the dramatic elements of games, the graphics. So we look at everything from 3D modeling, 3D animation, character design, character modeling, as well as uh, electives that students might take or anything from video game scoring uh, for uh, game music, creative writing if they want to get into the writing side of things. So there's a vast variety of uh, courses that they can focus on for the dramatic side of games. Some other Tips for getting into the industry is to network. You know, this event is a great example of networking with other like-minded individuals. There's also some national organizations that you can join. Uh, the Entertainment Software Association is the organization that oversees the video game rating and all instances and things related to the video game industry. They provide an annual report and have lots of information on video games from the sales to statistics. This is great, again, if you're trying to get funding. You can uh, provide some uh, target analysis as to how much that genre is making, how much that platform sales in, are making uh, from going to the ESA website. There's also the International Game Developers Association, which is a great organization. They are the ones that are behind the GDC, the Game Developers Conference, every year. And uh, this is another national organization that you can join. On the more development side of things, uh, there's the Association for Computer Machinery. Uh, they're more focused on uh, software engineering, but they have a subset group a special interest group in computer graphics, and that is Seagraph. Uh, we actually have a student Seagraph chapter, and um, Seagraph does anything related to computer graphics. So it's anything from the development of the software engineering for graphics to 3D modeling, animation, 3D printing, anything that involves graphics. So they have an international conference every year that is one of the by far the best conferences I've ever been to because it takes anything that you would see from a technical conference as well as basically like Comic Con stuff because it brings in the movie industry because all movies today are using computer graphics from special effects to animation to anything that you can conceive are being done with graphics and so they're all out there showing all the new technology and things that they're doing as well. Another great opportunity for you guys, and many of you may have participated in the Heartland Gaming Expo. How many of you participated in Heartland last year? So yeah, there's a couple of you. Well, we have gone through a new branding. We have changed the name from Heartland to the Computer Simulation and Gaming Conference, or CSGC for short. Um, this event will take place on April 12th and 13th, and we're kind of breaking it up into two days. The first day is going to be a conference. So it's gonna be a full day conference with speakers, workshops, hands-on demos, bring your own computer and come do a demo uh, workshop. 
and we'll have a lot of things going on. That'll be on the April 12th. And then, of course, April 13th will still be our uh, largest game development competition in Central U.S. And the interesting thing about this is that a lot of people think I have to have a functional game for the CSGC entry. That's not necessarily true. We have categories for everything. We have categories for just game design. Maybe you just have a design in your head. M anything from a game music, game art. We're also including this year because we're changing the focus from just gaming to computer simulation. So we have categories for actual like engineering simulations, architectural simulations, computer animations, so if you've done an animated short of some kind, we'll have a category for that as well. So to get more information, we do have a website, csgcconf, C-O-N-F dot com, um, but we are going to be hosting an info session at the University of Tulsa on November 12th at 6 p.m. in Keplinger Hall uh, in room 2005, and this will be in a uh, time where you could come in, get more information about the event, about all the contests. Uh, the uh, competition isn't until April, but it's now that you want to start working on those projects, start getting ideas so you can have something fully functional to enter in April. So we will have that uh, information on our Facebook page. Just look up a Computer Simulation and Gaming Conference or CSGC, I think it's just, uh, or CSGCONF is our um, at symbol. Is it on the other slide? I can't remember. Yeah, CSGCCONF, that's our at Facebook, at Twitter, um, and we're also on YouTube, so please like us on YouTube. <laughs> um, so there's that information. As uh, mentioned earlier, our CGREF chapter will also be hosting the Global Game Jam, which we'll talk a little bit at this event too, to encourage you to participate in that event so that you'll have something to present at CSGC this year. And I'm welcome to take any questions, comments, anything. Uh, there's my information if you wanna get uh, a hold of me. That is a current photo, by the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you have any questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, game design books. Are there any that you would recommend? Yes. Um, one of the best books is oh, the... Oh, okay. Uh, as far as game design books or learning game design, one of the best books out there is the Game Design Workshop by Tracy Fullerton. And that particular book is uh, where a lot of the information on player-centric design comes from. It's not a technical book. It doesn't have any, like, here's programming, here's Unity. It's all about generating ideas. It talks about the industry. Uh, it talks about design documents, how to pitch your ideas. But primarily, it focuses on developing those concepts and what you have to do in order to come up with a good game. And it also talks about analyzing other games. And as you play other games what should you be thinking about as a game designer and that's very important when you're passionate about what you do it should apply to everything so if you're passionate about building games when you play games you should be just as passionate getting that information thinking about well how did they come up with that where did that idea come from you know what were they thinking when this happened and you're just start, start thinking about that every time you are playing a game Good question. Any other questions? Dun, dun, dun. Did you say in one of those uh, talks something about uh, using the Unity engine for game design? Yes, we do offer a course in game engine design. So they develop a game engine. I, I think it's kind of a free flow, uh, for open form course. They can choose any language that they want. I believe one of our students did something with Vulcan as a base and he's been building on that ever since. Uh, so uh, I don't do the hardcore programming, so I can't say what they, what they do specifically, uh, but they do, they do make their own little mini game engine within it. If you have a 3D modeling questions, I can go for it. Yes. Oh, 
you can resubmit. Yeah, I mean, because you're looking at it from a different level now, because it's more functional, more updated. And one of the reasons we're encouraging people to come to the info session is that we're actually revamping how we s do our submissions. So one of the big problems we had is that our judges felt like they were rushed in judging. So they want everything submitted the week before so that they have a full week to play it. And so then you present at the event and then we will have the winners presented. And you also this year have to put together a 30 second to one minute commercial of your game. So we will play those throughout the entire event, but this also gives us a nice sort of Academy Awards feel when we gotta give presentations because not everybody gets to play everybody's game at the event. And so when we give out awards, we'd like to give something to show off, like this is what this game looked like. Yeah. Say that again. It's supposed to be 30 seconds to one minute. And all the details will be on the website. The website should go live next week. Uh, but again, uh, we'll be posting on uh, social media about the info session and encouraging people to come out to the info session to get more information. Um, we'd love for more, okay, so the question was to bring in more indie uh, professionals to the uh, CSGC conference, and we'd love for more indie professionals to come to the event. Um, I think it's just a matter of marketing and letting people know that this is available. Um, a lot of people don't even know that it's available to anybody other than college, because it is. It's open through, basically, we're open to K through 12. Uh, we've never had anybody under fifth grade enter, uh, but we have categories for everything. And so uh, we're encouraging everybody, you know, all of you in the audience to spread the word, to let people know. We will have a, a big Facebook campaign as well once the website gets launched. Uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar, but the University of Tulsa redid their entire website this year. And we've been waiting in the backlog of getting our website up after they did their launch. So uh, once that's all up, uh, we'll have some more information and details and hopefully to do a big push for that. Pretty heavy. Uh, let's everyone give a, another hand to Akram Tagavi Burris, please. <sighs> All right, I'm going to reiterate um, some of the things she was just saying, actually, uh, particularly about Heartland, which is now uh, C which is now CSGC, Computer Simulation and Gaming Conference, which dovetails nicely with the Computer Simulation and Gaming Degree Program at TU. That's a really great event. We've encouraged uh, our members to uh, uh, submit their games for the last two years. Uh, Daniel has done it the last two years. Um, and I think you've gotten prizes both years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, we had uh, another kid. Oh, God, what was his name? I, his name's escaping me. Uh, he made the most amazing game using a launch pad, which you're, if you're not familiar with it, is a, it's a device for making uh, like Skrillex beats pretty much. And uh, he used it to design a video game, and it was pretty amazing. And he did it in like a weekend. Logan, Logan, that's right. And he, man, it was great. 